John 5 verse 4. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Here's John 5 4. For everybody born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. 1 John 5 verse 4 For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. 1 John 5 verse 4 Very good kids! Good job kayo! Even yung mga hindi na feature sa video natin today, we appreciate every single one of you. Very good kayong lahat. Um, we're always happy and we're always encouraged to see everyone recite God's words. Sa mga nahihiya, huwag na kayong mahiya. Okay, mahiya. Um, we always look forward to watching kids recite God's words. Okay? We look forward to your submission next time. Okay, so good morning. Ako si Teacher M. And may tanong ako sa inyo. Ready na ba kayo to play a game? What's to play a game? Yeah, okay. So, tayo tayo, mabilis lang, we'll play a game. And ang game natin ay follow the leader. Sa game natin, si Teacher M, ako muna ang leader. And kayo, ang follower, ibig sabihin, kailangan nyo lang sundan or i-follow ang mga gagawin ko. Okay? Madali lang to. Your mommies and your daddies will check. If tama ang ginagawa ninyo sa bahay. <laughs> okay, game! So, let's play. Follow the leader. Put both of your hands up like this. Yan. Very good. Next. um, Your right hand, put it on top of your head. Like this. Okay, next. Your left finger, put it on top of your nose. Where's your nose? Where's your nose? Yan! Okay, next. Mm, your left hand, put it under your chin. Okay, last na. Mm, your right hand, dapat mag-finger hard. <laughs> like this. Yan! Very good, kids. Okay, yun lang. Upo na kayo. I will now explain yung game natin kanina. Very good. Okay, so that game, as mentioned kina, ang tawag doon ay follow the leader. And sa lahat ng nag-follow, good job kayong lahat kasi nag-follow talaga kayo. <laughs> um, sa Bible Kids, si Jesus, who is our ultimate leader, tinuruan niya tayo how to become his disciple. Can you try saying this with me? Disciple. Yan. This word means follower. And katulad ng nilaro natin kanina, as a disciple or as a follower of Jesus, our role is syempre to follow Him. Our role is to look at Him. Our role is to obey Him. Yun ang pagiging disciple ni Jesus. And part ng pag-obey natin kay Jesus is that we obey our parents. Part ni nun that we always read our Bibles, that we always pray, and syempre, we memorize God's words. <laughs> Kasama yun, kasi syempre, it will help us grow um, knowing God's words. So, kasama yun. Kaya make it a habit to always memorize God's words. Okay? Sige. Ayun. So, to all of Jesus' disciples, to all of the followers of Jesus, we invite you all to rise and let us sing, Captain of My Soul. Tara! I will walk where you tell me to walk I will talk when you tell me to talk I will go when you tell me to go And I'll stop when you say so I will walk where you tell me to walk I will talk when you tell me to talk, I will go When you tell me to go, and I'll stop When you say so, I will run When you tell me to run, I will come When you tell me to run, I will stop
tell me to come, I will rest when you tell me to rest because it's you who loves me best. Cause you're the captain of my soul. You are the one who's in control. I put my life into your hands and I will follow your command. Cause you're the captain of my soul. I will walk where you tell me to walk. I will talk when you tell me to talk. I will go when you tell me to go. And I'll stop when you say so. I will run when you tell me to run. I will come when you tell me to come. I will rest. When you tell me to rest Because it's you who loves me best Cause you're the captain of my soul You are the one who's in control I put my life into your hands And I will follow your command Cause you're the captain of my soul You're the captain of my soul You are the one who's in control I put my life into your hands And I will follow your commands Cause you're the captain of my soul Cause you're the captain of my soul the captain of my soul. It's memory verse time! Our memory verse for this week is in Mark 8, verse 34b. Jesus said, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. That is in Mark 8, verse 34b. Sige, so let us pray. Good morning, Jesus. God, salamat for being our leader. Um, Lord, we pray for all the kids that they will choose to look at you, that they will choose to obey you, to follow you, and to trust you. Lord, we pray for the rest of the day. Uh, we pray for the rest of the worship service, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye, kids! See you next week. Bye! Hello, kids! We made a dedicated Facebook page for you! Please ask your mommy or daddy na mag-join sila sa GCI PH Online Children Ministry page for all the announcements and activities. See you there!
Father God, good morning. You are our dear Tata God, and we are your children. Today we sit at your feet, ready to listen and fellowship with you and with one another. We acknowledge that you are God omnipotent. You can do anything. You are good, and you only want good things for your children and all of creation. You surround us with your love because that is who you are, love. Our fears, our sorrows, our doubts are slowly melting away because of your warm embrace. We need not fear because you keep us from all harm and you watch over our lives. Every cell in our bodies rejoice knowing we belong to you. We may feel weak at times, dear Lord, but you cover our weaknesses with your strength. You are our peace and comfort. You hold us in the palm of your hand. Nothing and no one can snatch us away from you. So today, we pray for those who do not know this truth yet. Let them know they have a Father who is present now and always. Let them know there is a Savior, Jesus, who gave up his life for their freedom. Today, we also pray for healing. The world is not only physically sick, but more so emotionally and spiritually. Touch our hearts. We let the Holy Spirit pull out the thorns of loneliness and hurt from our hearts. We let the Holy Spirit bring light to the dark parts of our souls and help each one of us to be instruments of your healing too. Teach us to listen and to extend kindness to everyone around us, face to face, on the phone or online. Teach us also to care for ourselves so we can care for others. Thank you, dear Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. We pray for all these in Jesus' name. Amen.
In C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, Lewis writes a descriptive picture of love gone bad. He introduces us to Mrs. Fidget, who is known for living for her family, but it turns out that this is not a complimentary description. Mrs. Fidget displays a distorted expression of love that makes the objects of her love miserable. For example, Lewis writes, For Mrs. Fidget, as she so often said, would work her fingers to the bone for her family. They couldn't stop her, nor could they, being decent people, quietly sit still and watch her to it. They had to help. Indeed, they were always having to help. That is, they did things for her to help her do things for them, which they didn't want done. Lewis had other humorous description of Mrs. Fidget that painted a picture of someone serving themselves in the name of love. Have you ever known someone like that? Someone who tries to control you on account of looking out for your best interests? I'm only doing this for you, they might say. They give gifts no one wants that end up being demanding burdens. Lurking behind their posture of love is a deep-seated self-interest. Their love for others is really a love for themselves. This distorted love may be easier to spot in someone else, but have you ever seen it in yourself? It may sneak into our actions more than we think. Even Martha, who welcomed Jesus into her home, seemed to be slipping into this trap while serving him. The story relays that Martha's sister, Mary, is listening to Jesus while sitting at his feet. Mary is exactly where she needs to be. But Martha begins to act a little like Mrs. Fidget. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Jesus was gentle. But he wasn't going to let Martha rob Mary of the words of life he was giving her. Maybe we need to hear Jesus' gentle correction ourselves and ask ourselves if we are focused on the more important things of life, following Jesus and loving others as he loved them. Either way, Jesus opposes the Mrs. Fidget approach to life where we get so distracted serving others with self-seeking expressions of love that we neglect what they need and what we need to stay focused on Jesus. This is the better part. Jesus says, which cannot be taken away from us. I'm Greg Williams, speaking of life. Okay, today we're going to talk about Eminem. No, I don't mean the rapper. No, no, I don't mean the candy. I know that's disappointing. No, we're going to talk about Eminem, Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha. Of the city of Bethany, who along with their brother Lazarus, were very close friends of Jesus. They deeply loved Jesus, and Jesus deeply loved them. So we're going to take a look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. So we're first going to go through the story, read the account, talk a little bit about it, and then after that we're going to discuss the implications and the applications of what we've read for us today as disciples of Jesus. 
So let's begin in Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Jesus and his disciples. Well, so far in the Gospel of Luke, on this journey to Jerusalem that Jesus has begun, uh, we've read of the 12 are with him, and then he sent out 70. So when it says Jesus and his disciples, we've got at least 82. That's, that's a sizable group. But remember, there are a whole group of pilgrims from Galilee going to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. So hard to say how many are in the group, but at least 82 disciples of Jesus along the way. So Jesus and his disciples were on their way to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, where, of course, Jesus was going to be crucified and die. So he came to a village. Now, what village? Well, Luke doesn't tell us, but John in chapter 11 of his gospel says that Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus lived in a village by the name of Bethany. Now, Bethany was located on the southeast slope of the Mount of Olives, about two miles east of Jerusalem. So they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, did you notice that? It was Martha's home. Now, maybe Mary lived with her. Lazarus maybe lived with her. But we have a lady here who owns a home. Now, we may not think that's unusual today, but in that era, that was a little bit different for a woman to own a home. There's no mention of a father, no mention of a husband. And you know, when we talk about m and M, Mary and Martha, there is no mention ever of a husband. And that's a little bit unusual in the culture of the day. Uh, in that particular culture, at that particular time, uh, young ladies were often married uh, in their middle teens. Certainly by their late teens, they were expected to be married. And we have two women here, no father, no husband. She has a large house. Now, were they orphans and did she inherit the house? It's a possibility. I think more likely they were two widows. I could be wrong, but just thinking, I know often we think of, of Mary and Martha as young women. I'm suggesting they might be older than we've imagined, and they are possibly widows, and she owns a house. Now, you might remember that Mary also is the one who poured a year's worth of salary of precious nard on Jesus to anoint him. I mean, how does she afford that kind of a year's salary worth? And Martha owns a house I'm thinking these are two wealthy widows. And I'm thinking they probably did a lot to support Jesus' ministry and all of his disciples with their wealth. So Martha opened her home to him. She's hospitable. Not only is she possibly wealthy, she is very hospitable and welcomes Jesus in. Now, did Jesus come alone? I have a feeling his disciples came with him. Now, in a parallel account of John, uh, where Mary anoints Jesus, we find that we at least, Laz uh, at least uh, Judas Iscariot was there. Now, I'm assuming, okay, uh, Martha, Mary, the brother Lazarus, uh, and Jesus and his disciples. How many? Well, 82. <laughs> What about the women who traveled with him that Luke tells us about, I think it's about chapter 8, where he had a number of uh, widows traveling with him who actually supported him in his ministry. Now, wait a minute. How many people can fit in this house? How big is this house? I get the feeling that it's a big house and that Martha and Mary got some money. Wealthy widows but very hospitable. So she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now it's interesting to note, Mary in this story doesn't say a word. She has no, no vocal part to play in the story. It's all Martha, Martha, Martha who does all the talking. 
So she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. What does that mean? It means Mary recognized Jesus as the prophet with the word of God. So she was going to listen to the prophet, the word of the prophet from God. But what does it mean to sit at someone's feet? That's an expression that means here's the rabbi, the teacher, and you are the disciple, the student. This means that for Luke expressing it this way, that Mary is in discipleship training. She is becoming a disciple of Jesus. Now, again, what's, what's strange about that? Not in our culture, but in that culture, women didn't do that. Women did not sit at the feet of rabbis. Women did not train to be disciples. This is a culture-breaking piece of news here that Jesus is allowing a female to sit at his feet and learn to become a better disciple. Wow. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Notice this, Luke tells us they had to be made. This is not some delusion on the part of Martha. She's not saying, you know, imagining this. This has, look, if you're going to have 12 people, if you're going to have Jesus, if you're going to have 12 more, if you're going to have 70 more, if you're going to have a group of women into your home and you're going to feed them, you got a lot of work to do. And there's no mention in this account of any servants. Just Martha. She had a lot of work on her hands, but she was willing to do it. She invited them into her home and was intent upon showing them the finest hospitality she possibly could, but uh, that caused her to be distracted. She came to him, that is to Jesus, and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now think about that. Whose fault is this? Well, my sister, Mary, not helping. Jesus, you're not helping much either. You're just sitting here teaching. What's wrong with you, Jesus? Why don't you tell my sister to get in the kitchen? Whoa. Now, who does Martha think Jesus is? Well, in John 11, she says you are the Christ, the Son of God. Martha knows who Jesus is. But think about this. How close are you to someone when you can talk to them like that and not be afraid? She knows who Jesus is, but is she afraid of him? No, maybe she's almost too familiar with him. He's like a brother to her. And so she just says, what's wrong with you? Why don't you tell my worthless sister Mary here to get in the kitchen where she belongs? Hmm. Verse 41, here's Jesus' response. Martha, Martha. I think that's where he said it. He didn't just, Martha. No, he said, Martha, Martha. I read this as a loving reply. He didn't take offense. He didn't get angry. He loves Martha. And she loves him. And in that bond of love, they can talk to each other like this. But Jesus says, Martha, I got to tell you something. And I think he speaks in love. I think he speaks instructively. Yes, he chides her a bit, but listen to what he says to her. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are, you are worried. You're, you're anxious. You're, you're, you're troubled with the cares of the physical things. You're worried and upset. Now, the Greek word there translated upset is kind of interesting because it can be translated making an uproar. You're making an uproar over this. You're worried and upset about many things. Yeah, you've got a lot on your plate, as we would say. I totally understand it, but, but take a breath. and Calm down a bit. You are upset about many things, but now here we have some manuscript problems. Some manuscripts read, but few things are needed, 
or indeed only one. Now, if that's the translation, what it means, few things are needed is like, we don't need all these dishes. I mean, if you brought out a pot of soup, I, we'd all be happy. But you're bringing out dish after dish after dish after dish. No wonder you're, you're perturbed and upset. We don't need all this, Martha. One dish would have been fine. But other manuscripts say, but only one. There's only one thing needed. Now, if you read it that way, the interpretation changes. If only one thing's needed, what's that? To be my disciple. You hear the word be trained, be my disciple. Listen to me. Have a relationship with me. Come spend time with me. Listen to me. I want to teach you. I want you to be my disciple. That's all that's needed. That's the main thing here. So, whichever way. He goes on to say, Mary has chosen. Now, here's the Greek. Listen to this. Mary has chosen what is the better portion. Now, it's literally good, but in this phrase, it's a comparison. So, Mary has chosen what is the better portion. Now, you get that? He's making a little play on the food. You brought all these portions out. But guess what? Mary has chosen the better portion. The better dish, which is what? To sit at my feet and learn and be a disciple. She's chosen the best dish of all. So Mary has chosen what is the better portion. And it will not be taken away from her. I'm not going to take her discipleship away from her. I'm not going to tell her, get in the kitchen where you belong, woman. I'm not going to do that. She's my disciple. And she's hearing my word and being trained to be an even better disciple. And I am not going to take that away from her by telling her to go in the kitchen and help you, Martha. Sorry. All right, that's the story. So what do we learn from this story? Well, one might say, ah, doesn't take a seminary education, doctoral degree, or a membership in Mensa to figure this one out. Pretty straightforward. Mary is good. She did the right thing, and she listened. Martha is bad. She didn't listen. She did the wrong thing. A number of years ago, somebody said, well, I don't understand our teaching on hell anymore. Can you please explain hell to me and make it simple so I can understand it? And I said, yes, I believe I can do that. I said, first of all, here's what you need to know. Heaven, good. Hell, bad. Is that clear? So I like this. All right, Mary, Martha. Martha, bad. Mary, good. <laughs> well, as famous preacher Hayden Robinson once said, he said what Jesus was saying to Martha was, Martha, don't just do something, sit there. Don't just do something, sit there. So what do we conclude? Well, some might say, well, isn't it obvious? We should be like Mary. That's, that's the point of the story. We should be like Mary. We should be like Mary. Don't clean the house. Don't cook. Don't serve food to your guests. Don't work hard. Let others do the work. While you take it easy and sit and are entertained and enlightened by your guests. Now, I like that interpretation. I'm going to take that to the bank. I don't think that's right. Then what is this story all about? What is Jesus saying? And what does Luke want his audience, that includes us today, to understand? Let's remember that this story occurs in the context of what's called Luke's travel narrative. It's starting, what, at Luke 9, all the way to the end of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is on his way from Galilee to Jerusalem to die. You realize how much of the Gospel of Luke, which is a lengthy gospel to begin with, but most of it is about what? This journey to Jerusalem. So, in this travel narrative, as Jesus sets his face, as Luke puts it, to go to Jerusalem, where he will face torture and death, Luke repeatedly records examples for us 
for his audience of that day and for his audience of today as well, of the necessity for, let me church, radical and devoted discipleship among Jesus' followers. I suggest that for Jesus and for Luke, who wants his audience to get it, the theme here of this travel narrative is radical and devoted discipleship. Let's review. Remember, Jesus, starting out on his journey through Samaria, had rebuked his disciples for showing anger rather than forgiveness for those who rejected him. Instructing his disciples how to behave and how to react as they shared the gospel. He has worn three would-be followers. You remember them? I will follow you. I will follow you. Follow me. But, but, but. He's warned his three would-be followers of the sacrifices they must make and the priorities they must have if they are going to be his disciples and follow him. Now, Jesus sent out the 70 of his disciples on a mission trip, and he warned them that they would be like lambs among wolves. Whoa. That doesn't make you want to go on mission, does it? <laughs> now, when the 70 returned, Jesus told his disciples that disciples should not rejoice about their great deeds and their great works of ministry and their fantastic spiritual gifts. They should rejoice that they're included in the life of God. Then Jesus told the story of the Samaritan, who was considered an outcast, but was willing to take risk and to sacrifice and serve in compassion-driven, hands-on, interpersonal ministry where others would not get involved. And now he tells the story of Martha and Mary to further illustrate what radical discipleship looks like. Now, Martha and Mary deeply loved Jesus, and Jesus deeply loved them. Martha shows her love for Jesus by inviting him and his disciples into her home and showing hospitality. She cleans for them. She cooks for them. She serves them. And she's going to clean up after them because she loves Jesus. She's willing to do all of that work and share her possessions, her food, her house with Jesus and his disciples because she loves him. Martha wants to honor Jesus by serving the best meal she can and by making him comfortable. She labors intensively to do this and hopes that she's pleased Jesus because she loves him. Now Mary shows her love for Jesus by sitting at his feet, listening to his word, and learning, being and training to be a radical, dedicated, deeply devoted disciple. She wants both a personal relationship with Jesus and to hear his word, his teaching, so she can be the kind of devoted disciple she should be, and please Jesus because she loves him. So who's right? Now who's wrong? Who's good? And who's bad in this story? Well, this is not exactly a story of either or, is it? It's not either or. If you're familiar with uh, impromptu comedy, in impromptu comedy, they always tell you it's a matter of yes and. Whatever somebody throws out, you don't say wait. You say yes and, meaning that you accept what has been said and now expand on it and go further. Follow me? Yes and I accept what's said. Now let me expand on that and take it further. So I'm saying <laughs> this is a matter like impromptu comedy. Yes, and. 
Now, as a pastor, and I've pastored churches from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the North to the South, over 50 years. I know I look like I'm a teenager, but yeah, over 50 years. As a pastor, who do I prefer having in my congregation? Martha's or Mary's? And the answer is, yes and. <laughs> yes and. We really need Martha's in the church. And let me tell you, I just love Martha's. I don't know a pastor who doesn't love Martha's in his church or her church. If we've got more Martha's, hey, Martha, show yourselves. Come on forward. Come on out. Let me, let me see who you are. I want to know you. We need you, Martha. Martha's, please come forward. And, yes, and we need Mary's. Who are willing to do some work and help out. And we need Martha's to be sure to set worship and relationship as a higher priority in their life than just work, service, or ministry so that they don't get all bent out of shape or frustrated or in an uproar because they've had to work too much. It is a matter of priorities. But you know what? Those things that are not priorities still have to be done. Say, well, that's not a priority. No, but it's got to be done. Sooner or later, maybe not first, but got to get her done. You know, we can talk about discipleship and ministry as a matter of up, in, and out. You follow me? Up, in worship, fellowship, communion with the triune God. In. As a matter of fellowship, communion, loving one another, growing in our faith together, and out. Love for our neighbor, a desire to share the gospel with others. Up, in, and out. Now, in our fellowship, our denomination, we've begun to call that the, the uh, hope, faith, and love avenues. Same thing, up, in, and out. Here's the thing. You can't really meaningfully and effectively go in or out until you've gone up. Now, should you only go up? No, you need to go in and out. But you can't go effectively in and out till you've gone up. So going up is the priority. But that doesn't mean you leave out the in and the out because it's not either or. It's what? Yes and. Yes and. Now, let's take a note of caution from Martha, okay? Let's take a note of caution here. I've seen well-meaning church members seek to love their neighbors also known as grow your church by doing outreach ministry and having what they call outside the walls events to reach out into the neighborhood. But what I've witnessed are some well-meaning folks getting so involved in the program, the organization, the preparation, the cleaning, the cooking, the serving, that they let those activities get in the way of being with the people and of sharing God's love and building relationships. Yeah, I've seen them cook hot dogs all day and never talk to anybody. I've seen them empty the garbage cans and work all, you know, and clean up the, the place afterwards and all that and never share a word with anyone who came. Wait, I mean, thank you for cooking the hot dogs. Thank you very much for emptying the trash. Thank you very much for setting things up and taking things down. Thank you very much. But why did we do this? 
just a structure to build relationships and, and to share God's love. But can you sometimes do one without the other? Sharing God's love is a priority, but you know what? Don't leave the trash undone. It's not either or. It's yes and. I've seen sometimes folks work so hard on the outreach event that they're exhausted and cranky during it and after it. And sometimes, you know what then they do afterwards? They blame other church members. Why wasn't Bob here? Bob's always too busy. Oh, he's got all those commentaries he reads all the time. But no, he can't come out here and dump the trash. You realize only a third of our congregation participated in this. Where's the other two thirds? What's wrong with them? Why didn't they get out here and work with us and help us in this? Oh, I had to work so hard. I stood out there in the hot sun all day doing all that. And, and I got no appreciation for it or anything like that. And you think some others could come out and help once in a while. <laughs> and you know what happens? Sometimes the love avenue can turn into the tired, cranky, perturbed, bad attitude boulevard. That's a caution we learned from Martha. We'd be well to take note of it. So the focus must be on God. Yes. And our neighbor. God, yes. And our neighbor. You can't focus on your neighbor till you focus on God. But when you focus on God, it should lead to loving your neighbor. Relationship. Now, relationship is built in our human frame of reference by spending time, by spending time with God and others in fellowship, interaction, listening, learning, and growing together in love. It's all about relationship. Now, true, there usually needs to be a framework constructed in, in which this can happen because we're human and we're physical, so we kind of need a framework in which this relationship can take place and happen. But the framework ought not to be the consuming focus, taking up all of our time and all of our energy and often leaving some hurt feelings and bad attitudes in its wake. So the answer is that first, spend time in fellowship with the triune God. Prayer, silence, listening. Meditation, Bible study, church attendance, communion, and the other spiritual disciplines that are the ways that we sit at the feet of Jesus. Hear his word and grow in being a radical, devoted disciple. Then what do we do? Get up on your feet. Go and serve and minister to others because that's what radical, devoted disciples do in response to having sat at Jesus' feet. It's not either or. It's yes and. So, here's the question. Should we be a radical and devoted disciple like Martha? Or should we be a radical and devoted disciple like Mary? What's the answer? Yes and amen. amen. Let us end our word today with the communion. Let us bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for these elements that physically remind us who you are. You are our Lord who gave everything to us, who intercedes for us. You search our hearts and reveal to us who we are in you. And as we take these elements, 
we remember the words written by Apostle Paul. And these are reminders for us of your love lavished upon us. Thank you, Jesus. My brothers and my sisters, let us eat the bread. Jesus, we remember. Let us lift the cup and drink. Jesus, we remember. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God.
When it comes to giving, our numbers don't always add up. We see how small we are and how great the need is, and the math doesn't seem to make sense. It's easy to think our gift won't matter, but God is not only the great physician, He's the great mathematician. When we think addition, God thinks multiplication. He has bigger plans for our gifts because He makes blessings multiply. He didn't feed only five people with five loaves of bread. He fed 5,000 with plenty to spare. When we trust God enough to give generously, we invite Him to pour grace upon grace until our gift grows in ways we could never imagine. He takes our gift, big or small, and multiplies the impact, touching the world with His love on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe it's time you let God do what He does best and multiply the blessings He has given you. What blessing will God multiply today? Because you trust Him enough to give. How to send our offerings? By bank deposit or online banking or mobile wallet app GCash. Please send your offerings to BPI account number 19910012235. Kindly email a screenshot of your offering to debbie.orogo at gci.org and or doris.manubai at gci.org or send screenshot of your offering via Facebook Messenger to Deb Season Orogo and Doris Madubai. Please include your name and church area so that your offering will be credited to your local church. As you go from here into the week ahead, with whatever joys and challenges it holds, do not be discouraged or disheartened. Remember the glory that awaits you as a child of God. Hold on to that truth. Live in that hope. And may the peace of God, the blessing of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you and among you. Amen. Amen.